Um, so tonight I'm not going to be mentioning King Arthur or any spin-doctoring monks. In fact, I didn't mention them to the reporter either, but uh, <laughs> so um, no doubt you'll still want to ask questions about them. Uh, but I am very pleased to be able to provide, the, to share really, the results of the archaeological excavations at Glastonbury. Uh, 36 seasons of excavations at Glastonbury, which took place between uh, 1904 and 1979, and which haven't been published until November 2015. And I hasten to add that although I have been in ecclesiastical archaeology for a long time, I didn't do these excavations. <laughs> Um, and I'd like to begin by setting the scene. Perhaps I don't need to for this audience, but I think it's useful to, to provide a little bit of the, the framework of the history and the legends um, that have really coloured previous assumptions about Glastonbury's archaeology before introducing the archaeological project and the new insights that it's delivered. So... It goes without saying, perhaps, that Glastonbury Abbey holds a unique place in the history of medieval monasticism. It was uh, often rumoured to be the earliest monastic foundation in Britain. It's the one that is said to have been unique in surviving the, the, the Viking raids. It's um, well known because of its association with the 10th century monastic reform through its abbot, St Dunstan. Uh, it was one of the most wealthy and influential monasteries at the, uh, the Norman Conquest, but also at Doomsday and, um, sorry, at, at the dissolution of the Abbey um, in 1539. But in addition to that, the Abbey's international fame was really built upon its legends. And of course, that's what still captures people's imaginations today, as, as I experienced uh, a month ago. It's well known very well known, it's been well known for a long time that the medieval monks deliberately cultivated an origin story to proclaim Glastonbury's primacy amongst British monasteries. So we know that a history of, of the abbey was um, commissioned around about 1130, uh, written by William of Malmesbury. Uh, he drew on earlier sources such as Bee's Life of Dunstan, uh, a, a life of Dunstan written by a, a monk of the Abbey who we know only as uh, Bee. They talked about the origins of the Abbey even in the 10th century as, as being built by divine agency, whereas William of Malmesbury was slightly more conservative in the 12th century, but he did say that missionaries may have founded the Abbey in the second century, and he cautiously recounted the story that there may even have been a link to the Apostles of Christ. Um, and of course, the, the well-known quote from William of Malmesbury, where he says that it was the, the earliest church of, of, all, of all those that he knows. Recent reassessment of the archive of Anglo-Saxon charters by Susan Kelly has also provided important new insight to the documented origins of the monastery and, and quite an amazing feat to, to wade her way through the, the forgeries and, and copies of charters. And she found that the earliest historical evidence dates from the last three decades of the 7th century with extant and lost charters granted by three West Saxon kings. So from her work and that of others, we can now be confident that there's no surviving historical evidence for a religious foundation at Glastonbury before the late seventh century. But it's important to remember that the medieval monks believed that they had developed from a much earlier foundation, and one which they would have described as an Irish or Celtic foundation with strong um, connections to uh, saints such as St. Patrick and St. Bridget who they believed had visited the early monastery and, and uh, for whom they had relics. By the mid, um, actually the mid-13th century, it says on the slide 14th, but I think by the mid-13th century, it was claimed that Joseph of Arimathea founded the abbey in AD 63. This is something that appeared in later interpolations of, of William of Malmesbury. And the important thing here is that it was possible to in, in a sense, ingratiate Glastonbury into the biblical story and to create a direct connection to the life of Christ, which would establish uh, the Abbey's premier status um, as the earliest Christian foundation in Britain. If, if that wasn't enough, the origin story being linked to the, to the life of Christ, we have the story of Glastonbury and the burial of King Arthur. And this is the Abbey achieving international notoriety as the burial place of King Arthur and Queen Guinevere. 
This is another long story in itself. Um, but the monks of Glastonbury claimed that they had discovered the graves, in the grave of the shared remains of Arthur and Guinevere in 1191, staging the spectacle of exhumation recorded by Gerald of Wales, who was a, a contemporary witness. And the monks actively promoted the secular cult of King Arthur really throughout the Middle Ages, alongside the Abbey's prodigious collection of 300 saints' relics. So the origin story has shaped the history and character of Glastonbury Abbey, and it continues to do so today. The, the myth-making, the legends of, of Glastonbury are very much a living tradition. But it's also impacted on archaeological interpretation, which is where it impacts on my story. Early excavators sought evidence for Arthur, Arimathea, and a Celtic island of saints. But the real archaeological story of Glastonbury Abbey really has remained largely untold. The site was purchased by the Church of England in, in 1907, and the monastic ruins were opened to the public, comprising the Lady Chapel, parts of the Great Church, and the famous Abbot's Kitchen. There's really nothing there of the monastic cloister itself, and so the excavations were required in order to uh, reconstruct the, the plan of the church in order to open it to the public, and also uh, to investigate the substance of Glastonbury's legends. Well, 36 seasons of archaeological excavation took place between 1904 and 1979. This was fieldwork conducted on very low budgets, sponsored by the Society of Antiquaries of London and also by the Somerset Archaeology and Natural History Society. There were eight different directors, including major figures in the history of medieval archaeology, Sir William St. John Hope, Sir Charles Pierce, Sir Alfred Clapham, and Dr. Courtney Arthur Raleigh Radford, who some of you may have known. The Abbey's first director of excavations, Frederick Bly Bond, is regarded as a pioneering figure of the New Age movement. The Abbey was mired in controversy when Bond revealed in 1918 that his archaeological methods relied on psychic experiments and dowsing. I do wonder how the Guardian would have reacted to that, actually. <laughs> Perhaps that's what I should have said. Curiously, all eight directors from 1904 to 1979, and this is the, the area that they covered in terms of excavations at Glastonbury, is rather more extensive than some of you may have thought. Well, they failed to publish anything more than brief interim reports. The limited, often biased nature of the published material has certainly been a major stumbling block, both to scholarly assessment of the significance of the excavations and for interpreting the site to the public. For a site of such major historical and legendary significance, the lack of archaeological understanding has been a major omission. So that's where I came in. Nearly 10 years ago, although it was a four-year funded project, I actually began this 10 years ago almost to the day um, when Warwick Rodwell uh, first convinced me that I should um, have a conversation. And actually the Bakers were, have, were also involved uh, around that time. Um, and I was asked by the Abbey, I thought I was being asked by the Abbey to help them get funding and just to sort of facilitate. But actually I've had to become quite a big part of my life. This has been a joint venture between the University of Reading and the trustees of Glastonbury Abbey, funded principally by the Arts and Humanities Research Council, but we've also had money from the British Academy, from private donors, from the Society for Medieval Archaeology, from the Somerset Archaeological Society, etc. And the project has yielded a wealth of detail and new evidence that's been published in the monograph that, that Richard kindly showed, but also there's a supplementary uh, source. The archives, the full digital archives, are now accessible to the public through the Archaeological Data Service. Um, so it's a massive data set. This is phase one of my project complete. <laughs> the second phase has just begun in October this year, again funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council. And this is to take the results of the project and to inform new audiences, particularly visitors to the Abbey. So we're doing digital reconstructions of the Abbey, a new guidebook, educational resources, discovery trails, etc. And tonight I will share some of the draft reconstructions for the very first time. I'd like to briefly introduce the archive project and the results tonight, focusing on some of the key archaeological research questions for the Saxon and, uh, and Anglo-Saxon and medieval monastery. The, the first question is around occupation predating the Anglo-Saxon monastery, and this is where the relationship to the origins myth is so important. 
Secondly, the scale of the Saxon monastery and craft working centre. We know so much more about Anglo-Saxon monasticism now than when Radford was doing his excavations in the 50s and 60s, that the craft working is a big question. And then there's the, the question of the cloister. Did Glastonbury have the earliest, earliest cloister in Britain? Um, questions I'm interested in, particularly as a later medievalist, did the legends result in a distinctive layout in the medieval church and cloister? I, I think they did. What is the archaeological evidence for the construction, form, and development of the medieval abbey buildings? And briefly, what does the material culture reveal about medieval monastic lifestyle and patterns of consumption? And I hope you'll appreciate it's a big book. There are a lot of questions. I'm going to have to go through these very briefly. Um, so the Glastonbury Abbey project, I know you can't see that very well, but this is just to show you the kind of primary archaeological records that we began with. These, uh, we were looking at antiquarian records from all of the seasons of excavations at the Abbey, but those undertaken by Raleigh Radford in the 1950s and 60s offered the greatest potential to increase understanding of the site. And these are some of his original field notebooks and drawings. Radford published his interim findings for the Saxon and Anglo-Norman phases. In fact, it was in a, a, a BAA conference transaction volume in the early 1980s. Uh, but virtually nothing has been published on the excavated evidence dating from the 12th century onwards. And, and in some ways, I think that's where the project makes its biggest contribution. The archive was predominantly complete, but the records and finds were disconnected. Indeed, they were kept under a bed in the guest room for many years in Raleigh Radford's house. And the, the first very daunting task, which was undertaken principally by Dr. Cheryl Green, was to uh, catalogue, scan, transcribe all of these to create a digital record um, and to construct an integrated archaeological database to enable the records to be used with ease. And all of these resources are now publicly available through the Archaeology Data Service. We also revisited all of the collections, the material that had been retained from the excavations, and 31 specialists re-examined all classes of finds. Uh, we also did uh, chemical and compositional analysis of glass and metal, and petrological analysis of pottery and tile. So it's quite a, you know, a cast of thousands. It's like Ben-Hur, I sometimes felt myself. Um, and a framework of independent dating was established for the first time based on reassessment of finds, but also radiocarbon dating of organic material from the 1950s excavations. We also did a <clears throat> comprehensive geophysical survey. This was undertaken by GSB Prospection. We hoped that we would be able to do deposit modeling and all sorts of things, but actually the most basic requirement was to map the excavation trenches because um, all of the, the, the plans of the trenches were just floating. There was no real relationship to ordnance datum. Um, so ground truth for the location of the trenches was important as well as adding some knowledge of survival of deposits. The principal aim of the project was to set aside previous assumptions based on the historical and legendary traditions, and, and certainly Radford's own interpretations were highly influenced by the, the, the cultural tradition, and to provide a rigorous reassessment of the archive of antiquarian excavations. So if I use the research questions I outlined as, as a starting point, I'll, I'll go to the post-Roman Glastonbury. And I think some of the most important new evidence is the identification of, of previously unknown prehistoric and post-Roman occupation at Glastonbury. We have Mesolithic flints and also a, a reasonable assemblage of Iron Age pottery. And this contributes to growing evidence for prehistoric occupation in the direct locality of, of Glastonbury and the Abbey site. The presence of small quantities of Roman tile, pottery, and small finds also indicates that substantial Roman structures were located in the vicinity. By substantial, I mean a structure with a hypercost system because these tiles were reused in the abbey. <coughs> Excuse me. But the most exciting evidence of all is this pottery. Um, this is LRA1, late Roman Amphora 1, which may be known to some of you as B2 ware. It was when I was undergraduate, that was what it was called. And these shards of pottery are probably what most people will remember from, from this excavation report. Um, this indicates that um, pottery from the Eastern Mediterranean, dating to around 450 to 550, uh, was used at Glastonbury. This is important for a number of reasons, but, but first I want to explain, um, this particular pottery was also found um, 
with a roughly trodden floor surface and a series of post pits um, connected with one or more timber structures. So we seem to have here um, an occupation sequence, possible timber halls associated with the 5th or 6th century. Uh, the reason that this is so important is that um, it challenges the prevailing view that occupation at Glastonbury didn't occur until around about 700, and that the primary um, religious sites of the area were Glastonbury Tor over here and Beckery. This was an idea proposed by Philip Rotz on the basis of his excavations at these sites, and it was one that was accepted by, by Radford. Um, so the finding of this pottery in association with a floor sequence and, and possibly timber halls is really quite important in terms of understanding antecedent uh, settlement at Glastonbury Abbey. So turning to the Saxon monastery itself, the main evidence is the, the boundary ditch, um, which is uh, in orange there on the geophysics. It's going to work. There it is. Okay. Um, the boundary ditch, a sequence of stone churches, and an associated glassworking complex. Now, the, the boundary ditch is important. It's one that, uh, a feature that Radford thought was very important for de defining and identifying the monastery. What's distinctive about it at Glastonbury, I nearly said Reading then. I'm working on Reading Abbey now, and I'm going to find this difficult. What's distinctive at Glastonbury is it's quite a substantial feature, almost potentially a defensive feature. Um, and since uh, Radford did his excavations, there have also been uh, subsequent excavators in the town doing watching briefs and other things who found other sequences of ditches. It's very tempting for archaeologists to join the dots and to uh, cr create a kind of uh, continuous sequence. We don't know whether these all can be connected. The dating evidence from them, uh, radiocarbon dating, comes from the 7th century to the 12th century. There's no dating evidence associated with the ditch con um, excavated by Radford over here. Um, if they are contemporary, they certainly are within the tradition of um, a sort of uh, square uh, monastic uh, enclosure, uh, which would be characteristic of the Anglo-Saxon tradition. But I think quite a lot of work is going to be required uh, to determine whether this is the, uh, the original plan of Glastonbury Abbey, but it's possible that this is the, the first phase of the monastic enclosure before it was extended in the 12th century. The Saxon churches were excavated in the 1920s, um, so the entire width of the western area of the medieval nave was excavated. It was an early open area excavation and quite interesting. Um, also really well recorded on the basis of stratigraphic evidence from mortars. Um, the details and colours of the mortars were described. So I'm reasonably confident that we have three clear phases here. I'm less confident about some details. Uh, this, is, this is phase one. It's showing you in, in the orange colour there, this particular phase, where we've got certainly a two-cell church, possibly a three-cell church, with porticus and this separate crypt feature here. What I'm a little uncertain on is the relationship between the two, um, but certainly uh, the, the general assumption of the excavators at the time was that these were detached features and that there was some sort of apsidal chancel. So reconstruction coming. This is a reconstruction of that particular phase. Um, it's a draft. Um, it's done by the Center for the Study of Christianity and Culture at the University of York. Uh, if, I'm sure some of you have been involved in doing reconstruction drawings. The difficulty of moving from the excavated evidence to the three-dimensional form is, is quite challenging. In this particular case, we do have things like the Opus Signinum floors, so we know that they are reusing Roman materials. Um, we are uh, therefore drawing inferences and making comparisons with a number of churches that, that you may, may recognize, but that gives you an idea of what the first phase church may have looked like. It makes a big, huge difference to me seeing it in a three-dimensional form. The second phase of the church, the um, little crypt feature there is enclosed within um, a square eastern end and possibly more porticos and an atrium feature is there. Again, I'm not 100% sure about the atrium, but it looks lovely in the reconstruction. Um, it looked very monastic. I've actually toned down the monasticism as much as I could there. Um, but you can see that it's a much larger structure here, and it's got these two-story porticos, which was, would presumably have had a, a liturgical function. It's looking awfully like Earl's Barton uh, by this stage. Um, in the third phase, the crypt is filled in and a tower is constructed here. 
the eastern end is extended. And the um, human remains from the crypt are all placed within this in enormous shared coffin. The remains of 15, uh, 18 individuals are placed here in, in the entrance. And here you can see um, the fully reconstructed um, Anglo-Saxon church. I'd be interested to hear from some of you afterwards how you think these are looking. They are in draft. Um, and we will eventually have reconstructions of the Romanesque cloister, the 14th century church, uh, the abbot's hall, and the lady chapel with all its polychromy. So it'll be really fantastic for visitors, I think, because Glastonbury is quite a difficult site to understand on the ground. Getting back to the Saxon evidence, um, the other really important thing at Glastonbury is the um, uh, evidence for the Saxon furnaces. There are at least five, maybe more than that, glass furnaces in situ. They are unique in, in Britain, we think, in having um, the structural evidence for the floors still in situ and having some of the waste and crucible evidence still in situ. Now, these have been um, re-studied by Hugh Wilmot and Kate Wellham, who've done the stratigraphic analysis as well as uh, chemical analysis of the glass. There were 262 finds associated, including vessel and window glass, waste and crucible fra uh, fragments, um, a glass block, a reticilla, ret reticilla rod, a curved iron tube that might have been a blowing tube. And you can see the, the colors in involved, principally blue and green and some brown. Now Radford originally assigned a date in the 9th or 10th century uh, for the glassworking complex, partly based on stratigraphic evidence, but I think also based on his assumption that it must have something to do with Dunstan, the great craftsman. That's what he was expecting to see. The vessel fragments were sub subsequently re reassessed by Vera Everson, who thought they were much more typical of the 7th century or 8th century. Now, we've been very fortunate to be able to obtain radiocarbon evidence from organic material that was retained in the 1950s, and I think it was very prescient of them to retain it. Uh, the dates provide a broad age range between 605 and 882, but this can be narrowed down, that's 2 sigma to 605 to 780. There's not a lot of dates there, but we have undertaken Bayesian analysis. Peter Marshall did this for me, and it supports the proposal that glass making was a short-lived single event likely to date to the late 7th or 8th century. So this was not a massive site of, of production in the way that some of the Irish monasteries or a site like Port Mahomet was. This doesn't seem to have been a major craftworking centre, but rather glassworking associated with the primary construction of the first uh, stone churches at Glastonbury. Chemical analyses of the glass confirms that it fits the broader compositional picture for early glass in Britain from the 6th to the 9th centuries. In other words, the glassmakers are remelting old Roman material, possibly imported as colour from the continent. So it's very like the Jarrow and Wearmouth material. And the dating evidence from the glass furnaces also can be used to support um, at least in some way, the, the dates for the construction of the church. The radiocarbon dates place it around 700, corresponding with the known currency of the plan form and also the use of opus signinum flooring. And this also corresponds with the documentary evidence and the uh, findings of Susan Kelly that it's not until the last decades of, of the 7th century um, that we see the founding or refounding of the monastery by um, King Ina of Wessex. Um, Moving on to the next question that I mentioned, did Glastonbury have the earliest monastic cloister in Britain? I know some of you have heard me say this before. No, I don't think it did. This um, drawing here is Ratz's interpretation of um, the pre-conquest layout taken from Radford's evidence. So this is the church complex that I've been talking about here. This is his um, cloister complex that he thought he had. And for comparison, I've just put up there a slide from uh, Rosemary Cramp's book on, I think it was volume one, on Jarrow and monk Wermuth, where she superimposed Jarrow and w monk Wermuth on Glastonbury, which you can see is absolutely enormous. Um, it gives you an idea of how unlikely it is that you would have a, a cloister of, of this scale at this date. But going back to the archaeological evidence, this is where mapping was so important. That when we mapped the ranges, if I just roughly outline, this would be where he thought he had um, the cloister. When you map them, you can see that the eastern walls of, of the e so-called so eastern range don't actually align 
Um, and there's no evidence that the ranges that are on either side, north and south of the later refectory here, actually join up. And the evidence over there, I'm, well, there's not very much to go on. Radford assumed that these were contemporaneous, even though they were observed during separate campaigns in the 1930s, the 1950s, and the 1970s. He was relying on his own memory and that of others to, um, to, to see observed similarities in the construction. Um, I think the mapping shows that it's probably uh, doubtful. Um, instead, it, it would appear to me that several freestanding ranges are likely to have been there, much more along the lines of, of Wearmouth and Jarrow. And I think that Radford's um, optimistic interpretation of a cloister is, is probably led by the documentary sources, and in particular, uh, Bee's Life of Dunstan, which talks about Dunstan surrounding the cloister on every side with solid um, monastery buildings. But of course, claustrum can refer to either an enclosure or a formal cloister. And it is also important to note that at the time that Radford was doing his excavations, we really didn't know what an Anglo-Saxon monastery looked like. The comparators that I can draw on now um, had not been published at the time that he was doing his work. So I'm not going to say anything more about the Saxon monastery. I'm going to move on to the, the later medieval monastery. And the questions um, that I've posed here, um, well, this is really going to be the first opportunity to have the full medieval plan of Glastonbury published. We know that it was remarkable for the scale of its final phase church, and it's also distinctive in certain aspects of its layout, in particular the location of the Lady Chapel to the western uh, end of the church. I, don't, I think in this may sound obvious, but what people really haven't talked about before is how this unusual um, sighting of the Lady Chapel impacted on the planning of the later medieval monastery. And of course, the reason why the Lady Chapel is there is that the, the old church, the so-called ancient church, which William of Malmesbury talks about and is referred to in Bee's Life, Bee's Life of Dunstan, etc., this old church which may or may not have been founded by Joseph of Arimathea uh, in AD 63 or missionaries in AD 166. Whatever it was, there was an ancient church and it burnt down in 1184. But the site was of such significance to the monastery that they immediately built the Lady Chapel on the same site, even if, though it's in this slightly incongruous uh, position. Um, the impact that that has is, is enormous because the monk cemetery is sited in location to that. Well, those of you who know about monastic archaeology will know that the, the monastery should have been putting its cemetery over here. At least the monk cemetery should be here. I don't know of another monastery which has the monk cemetery there. And this is be because this is the most sacred space within the monastery. It's the one which has the association with the early community of saints, and it's where the monks want to be. Uh, but the other curious thing is the lack of a West Range. I, I assumed that we would find a West Range in the excavations. There really was no West Range. Um, so you, I think uniquely of a, of a Benedictine monastery of this scale, uh, Glastonbury didn't have a West Range. It was common for some smaller uh, cells uh, and pre-monstratensian abbeys and some nunneries. But um, for a monastery of this scale, not to have a West Range is unusual. And I think the reason is that the abbot's hall here, the abbot's private accommodation and the accommodation for the guests, was sited in order to have direct intervisibility here with the Lady Chapel and this sacred site. So we can see Im immediately how um, the legend, the stories, the history of, of, of Glastonbury um, also continues to um, influence the planning of the monastery right through the later Middle Ages. In terms of the stratigraphic evidence coming from the archive, well, I could only study what previous excavators could, so I can't answer all your questions, unfortunately. So, for example, the late 11th century plan. You'll see this is fairly limited, and actually what Radford published of this phase in the BAA um, uh, volume was quite accurate. Um, we have only minimal um, construction, evidence for minimal construction in the early Norman period. A church was begun to the east of the Saxon church, um, but we have little evidence for its plan other than to say that it had transepts and possibly apsidal chapels radiating from the eastern end. 
We know this first Norman church was never completed, and it appears sorry, that the Saxon church and domestic buildings remained in use right up to the 12th century. I know this sounds unlikely, but the stratigraphic evidence is, is suggesting, at least the evidence we have, is, is not showing um, the, uh, the building of Norman monastic ranges, at least until the early 12th century. And this is quite surprising. However, the specific circumstances at Glastonbury, I think, need to be taken into account. The, the social context was not conducive to a major program of reconstruction. The transition from the Anglo-Saxon Norman tree to Norman monastery was particularly painful, and some of you will know the story. The last Anglo-Saxon abbot, Ethelmoth, was taken hostage by King William in 1067, and the first Norman abbot that came in, Turston, imposed changes in, in liturgy and lifestyle that were not appreciated by the monks of Glastonbury Abbey. Um, and they were stubbornly resisted by the monks. Um, this didn't just result in a sort of, you know, passive hunger strike or something like that. It, it culminated in a bloody battle in the, in the Abbey church in, it, in which at least two monks were killed and 14 were wounded. Um, so possibly rebuilding of the, the, the monastic ranges and construction of a cloister were not the highest priority. In contrast, we have significant evidence for the 12th century building campaign. This was comprehensive and uh, began at the eastern end of the church, as would be expected. Again, we don't have sufficient evidence to do much of a reconstruction, um, but we can um, do some comparisons based on contemporary churches, and you can see uh, the, the limited evidence that we do actually have for this phase. Um, the ambitious uh, work that was begun here, though, we have uh, the, the monastic buildings first being set out in the 12th century, and we have evidence for um, um, possibly rebuilding of the cloister. I can't believe that they would have been so late as to leave the cloister to the mid-12th century. So I'm assuming that we have an early 12th century cloister and ranges, and that we then have um, a comprehensive rebuilding in the mid-12th century uh, associated with Henry of Blois. So Henry of Blois, as many of you know, particularly Lindy, uh, grandson and son of William I, nephew of Henry I and brother of King Stephen. Henry comes in and um, apparently finds the place in ruins. So this is a quote from John of, of Glastonbury's Chronicle. Henry raised from their foundations the bell tower, chapter house, cloister, lavatorium, refectory, dormitory, the infirmary of his chapel, a beautiful and spacious palace, an attractive gate of dress stone, a great brewery, and a stable for many horses. So whatever the early Norman abbots had done at Glastonbury, it doesn't seem to have been particularly substantial, or later chroniclers want to associate it with Henry of Blois, um, but the archaeology is also showing us the first substantial cloister is associated more with the period of the mid-12th century. These are the um, remarkable capitals in blue lias, limestone um, which survive at Glastonbury and which have been studied as part of this project by Ron Baxter. Uh, there are 40 of these. Uh, they're richly carved um, and can be reconstructed and I'm looking forward to doing that. Um, the petrology of the capitals, if the blue lie of stone, confirms that they are uh, made locally, but the artistic connections don't seem to be with workshops in the southwest, but rather with uh, sites produced, uh, sorry, sites controlled by Henry of Blois, um, like uh, Wolsey Palace in Winchester. We also have early stained glass here. Um, associated with this period. This has been studied by Pam Graves. The full assemblage of medieval glass is around 2,000 fragments. We have relatively few of these, um, but these have been um, chemically confirmed to be durable blue glass dated to the 12th century. And it confirms that Glastonbury's early glazing, glazing schemes were of the highest quality, comparable to places like York, Winchester, Chart, and Saint-Denis. The really interesting thing about this glass is that it survives up to the dissolution, and it suggests that when the site, when the church was reconstructed, that this 12th century glass was actually reused in later windows in a sort of a theme typical of Glastonbury of, of reusing and emulating um, older styles in order to uh, marshal antiquity, as, as Julia Crick put it. 
Um, the archaeological evidence for the major fire that I mentioned in 1184 certainly was recorded by archaeologists, both in the Abbot's Hall and in the eastern part of the cloister. But the fantastic capitals that we have are not all fire damaged, so it does suggest that quite a lot of the cloister may have survived the fire. But we do know that um, the timber church and the great church were severely damaged. And that initial building after the 1184 focused principally on the, uh, the Lady Chapel and then turned to the eastern end of the church. And the surviving Lady Chapel is a hybrid of, of Romanesque and Gothic. And it's been suggested that its form and decoration were deliberately archaic in order to recall the old timber church. Again, indicating the importance of the Lady Chapel, um, representing really the sacred heritage of Glastonbury and the ancient community. These are um, early reconstructions of the Eastern End by Bond and Henderson. Um, I, we will be having artist reconstructions um, of the new church based on work by Jerry Sampson. And here's a sort of rough uh, axonometric reconstruction that Jerry's done. And I will go through some of his um, phasing evidence, but this is really Jerry's work and certainly not mine. His dating is based on the standing fabric and the work stone assemblage from the church, but his dating framework comes from close comparison with Wells and the documented construction at Wells, but in particular the mason's marks, because the, they are sharing masons, and he's been able to develop a chronology for Glastonbury Abbey based on this very close analysis. So I'll just, for those of you who, who, who can't see this, He's arguing that the lower parts of the nave walls were, were completed um, really immediately after the fire of 1184. And we know that um, certainly the, the Lady Chapel is reconstructed within two years, reconstructed and conse consecrated within two years. So it is a rapid building program. Uh, the clear street and the roof of the eastern arm, he thinks, were completed by circa 1200. Um, and the clerestory and roof of the transepts and the tower date to circa 1213, uh, when the church was reconsecrated. He thinks there was then a hiatus in building, um, and that the subsequent development of the church includes the, the Galilee, and the Galilee is an important structure that connects the main church to the, to the Lady Chapel, allowing a sort of full um, liturgical space with, for the community to, to process throughout the eastern end. I've also shown some of the figural carvings here, which are either from the Galilee or from the North Transept, which demonstrate the you know, outstanding quality of the early English Abbey Church, comprising white stone heads and, and drapery. And some of you will remember these being um, exhibited um, in the um, Age of Chivalry, I think it was, a long time ago. Um, this is the full plan of later medieval Glastonbury. Uh, this is... Um, important in terms of seeing the layout of the, the, the full cloister, the rebuilding here. Arch archaeologically, the refectory was particularly um, well preserved. Bond excavated this and recorded it in really high level of accuracy and found internal features for water management and so on. Uh, we have the full plan of the dormitory. We have evidence for a number of cross walls, but no features like fireplaces or anything. But quite a lot of evidence for the, the nature of the, the refectory, uh, the form of the chapter house and, and the number of rebuildings. Um, but perhaps the, the most surprising thing, as I've mentioned previously, uh, the, the lack of evidence for a proper West Range, a number of short-lived structures in this area, a number of rooms, but they never developed into um, a formal West Range. Um, this is, as I've said, um, possibly unique. Certainly we know that um, abbots at other monasteries begin in the West Range and they move out of it. Um, uh, places like Bury St. Edmunds come to mind where they do quite a substantial palatial um, complex away from the cloister. But the abbots at Glastonbury, of course, were um, ambitious men who certainly regarded themselves as being the equivalent of bishops. And it may be something to do with the status of Henry of Blois or the um, local competition with the bishops of, of Wells. Um, but the, the bishops, sorry, the abbots at Glastonbury constructed this palatial complex for themselves. Um, many of you will know the surviving abbot's kitchen, but this shows you the scale of the complex, which is uh, eventually results in a courtyard um, larger than the size of the cloister itself. And here we have 
a busy illustration, I'm sorry about this, but what I'm actually showing you here is the archaeological evidence, the geophysics evidence placed behind it. And the reason that this is so important is that it, it gives us some evidence for um, not just the plan of the hall here, um, but a secondary hall here, um, which is late 15th century. Um, and we've been able to reconstruct the form of this from the excavations and the geophysics as a, as a, a, a large structure with um, cobbled walkways, almost uh, presumably a sort of formal landscaped garden of some kind, communicating with the main hall here. And um, the Stukeley illustration of this area from 1723 gives you some idea of, of how it developed. And again, you can see um, some sort of formal planting at that time. But we do think that there was something there around um, circa 1500. And as I've said, this, the scale of the um, surviving kitchen gives you some idea of what that may have looked like. I've talked mainly about plan and buildings. I wanted to end with something on monastic material culture. Um, the collections at Glastonbury are uh, representative of monastic life in the High Middle Ages, um, but they're actually quite selective, and I think this is partly due to the policy of selective retention of successive excavators, so that we don't have everyday <laughs> objects or low-status objects. They were clearly selecting the things which they thought were high-status or important. But there are also some genuine biases, or rather some genuine absences in the material culture assemblage, particularly towards the earlier periods. Um, we have a complete dearth of material for the Anglo-Saxon period, and very little really um, bet before the sort of 13th or 14th century. So we have a, a collection biased towards decorative and high-status artifacts. Um, and we have substantial evidence for the monastic life, uh, for, for literacy, for example. Um, and there is um, a, a report on the small finds written by Jeff Egan and Paul Courtney and myself, uh, because both Jeff and Paul sadly passed away during this program, during, during this program of work. Um, the evidence for literacy includes things like writing implements, uh, book bindings, book clasps, a book binding tool indicating the kind of work in scriptorium, as well as these items which are fairly common at monastic sites, the um, oyster shells with uh, being used as palettes with, with um, rare pigments in them. We also have uh, monastic material culture uh, indicating religious devotion. We don't know whether these are items that would have been owned or used by monks or by visitors, of course, um, but there's substantial evidence for veneration of the Virgin, for example, this is um, a copper alloy plaque with um, roses, a symbol of the Virgin, but also um, an inscription from the Song of Songs. We also have um, evidence for the veneration of the Passion of Christ, um, such as a terracotta medallion with the sacred wound, and this rather curious little object, which may be a portable, portable reliquary, we're not sure, um, uh, but certainly has the IHS um, symbol on it. As well as uh, the small finds, we have a uh, pottery assemblage of over 8,000 fragments. This was studied by a large team of experts led by John Allen. It includes uh, tablewares imported from northern France, uh, but principally locally made products, particularly from Bristol. And the pottery assemblage for the high medieval period is really unusual in the low number of imported wares. You would think that an abbey like Glastonbury would have been represented by a higher number of imported objects. The Bristol Redcliffe wares dominate, including elaborate jugs with, um, I don't know if you can see some of the, the faces and, and of human faces and birds. Um, and towards the end of the Middle Ages, we do have imported uh, wares and um, maracas. <coughs> we have a large selection of ceramic tiles. 7,000 ceramic tiles studied by Jane Harcourt represents a wide range of motifs, some unique to Glastonbury like these, probably associated with Abbot Beer. Um, and chemical analysis of the clay used in the fabric shows that the majority were made at kilns very close to, to Glastonbury using local materials. So in summary, um, I apologize for the brevity, but I am just about keeping to time, I think. The archive project has yielded new evidence for the scale and significance of the later medieval monastery. I've only been able to gloss over this today. 
I think there are distinctive elements of planning that were closely connected with the Abbey's legends, but particularly with the status of its monks and abbots. Abbots, rather. The project has also revealed that some of the best known archaeological facts about Glastonbury uh, are themselves myths perpetuated by the Abbey's excavators, such as the alleged Saxon cloister. We've also identified a number of new questions for future research. So we have a number of questions around the later medieval plan. For example, the form and location of the infirmary complex is something I'm particularly interested in. And a striking feature of the finds assemblage is the lack of evidence for metal objects dating to the Middle and Late Saxon periods. And this paucity of evidence from the 7th to 9th centuries prompts the question of whether the early monastic core has actually been located. It may still be there waiting to be found. It is feasible that the main domestic buildings of the Middle Saxon monastery were situated to the north of the church in an area yet to be examined. And of course, fresh excavations would be required to fully understand the character and dating of the Anglo-Saxon monastery at, at, at Glastonbury. Even the nature of that uh, ballum, the Ballonbury ditch, would require um, some, at least a, a project of coring in conjunction with radiocarbon dating. The presence of the LRA pottery confirms that occupation did take place at Glastonbury in the 5th and 6th century. That may be the most intriguing question to leave you with because it reopens the issue of whether there was an early religious settlement based at Glastonbury before the, Saxon of the, before the foundation of the Saxon monastery in the late 7th century. So the key question is whether the occupation at Glastonbury um, was religious or secular in character or both. And does the presence of the LRA1 confirm the British monastery that's attested by the legendary traditions and which Raleigh Radford was so keen to find? Or to the contrary, does it indicate a secular settlement that was engaged in trade? Evidence for the post-Roman settlement will no doubt fuel speculation on Glastonbury's Arthurian connections. Publication of the monograph and digital archive brings Glastonbury's archaeological evidence to the public for the very first time. It represents the culmination of work by a large project team, but also the endeavours and achievements of previous generations, from Blybond to Raleigh Radford. And I think the archaeological story of Glastonbury will continue to unfold as this work sparks new questions, debates and interpretations. Thank you. <laughs>